Welcome back to another live community classroom with Michaels. Today we have Tamara from Oogly uh, with us ready for another exciting class. Today we'll be crocheting the star coasters, as you just said. <laughs> My name is Lillian from Yarnspirations and I'll be helping with any questions you might have during today's class. Feel free to ask questions in the chat here and we'll be sure that Tamara answers them. While we're giving you some time to join the class, feel free to let us know where you're watching from. And just a reminder that today's class is being recorded and you can find the recording on michaels.com slash classes. Okay. All righty. So as she was saying, we're making these great coasters and these are made with Red Heart Super Saver. You can see what's left of the skein I was using right here. Plenty of coasters, as you can see from one skein. And like I said, this is a really versatile pattern. I think this looks really fun in red. It reminds me of a poinsettia. If you did it in white, it would look like a snowflake. Um, so especially this time of year, it's a lot of fun. And while it's made in Red Heart Super Saver for coasters, if you made this in Lily Sugar and Cream or Red Heart Scrubby Smoothie, you would also have a great dishcloth that would be really festive and fun. So lots of possibilities for this pattern. So you can go ahead and grab your worsted weight yarn and the hook we're going to be using is a USF 3.75 millimeter hook. So if I hold these up to the camera here, you can see these hooks are a little bit smaller than you might normally use for this weight of yarn. And that's going to help create the stiffness that we want in our coaster. You can see here, it has a little bit of stiffness and stands up a little bit more. Also to help with that stiffness, they recommend for this pattern that you use some fabric stiffener. I happen to have this heavy spray starch. It's my favorite way to stiffen things. But again, this is optional. If you don't want to stiffen your coaster, you don't have to. It'll still work as a great coaster. And of course, if you're making it as a dishcloth, you probably won't want to stiffen it. That said, if you are making it as an ornament or you're making other ornaments, like with your um, Aunt Lydia's thread, then having something like this can be a really great way to stiffen those items uh, without making a big mess. You just spray it on the back, let it dry and go. So we'll be hopefully going over a little bit about more about this at the end. And I've also brought over my blocking pins and mats so we can talk a little bit about blocking it out when it's done. So let's go ahead now and get started. I'm gonna move to the overhead camera here. I'm gonna pull it over in front of me. There we are. And hopefully we'll be able to see my hands here so I can demo exactly what I'm doing. There we go. I just have to hit a little button to make my notifications go away on my phone. So we can see my hands right here. I'm gonna be demonstrating, you can see the red one right here. I'm gonna be demonstrating in green because I think it's a little bit easier to actually see those stitches on camera. So one of the great things with Red Heart Super Saver, which you can see right here, is that it will tell you what end to pull the yarn from because Red Heart Super Saver is a center pull ball. So you can see right here, I've got the end coming right out of my skein. And if you're still looking for the pattern, you can download it from the chat. There's a link right in the chat. So you'll notice I held up a couple of different hooks to talk about today. And the reason that I brought two hooks over here is that as I'm sure you know, if you've been crocheting for a while, hooks have different shapes. And when you're working with a smaller than recommended hook for the yarn size, which we often do on purpose, like I say, to make it a little stiffer, then you may find it easier to work with one type of hook rather than another. Um, just, you know, whatever works best for you. There's no right or wrong. It's whatever is easiest for you to grab that yarn with. So I did see one comment pop up saying they couldn't see my hands and I'm not sure if I can see them. Hopefully let us know if you can see my hands. Hopefully um, it's working for everybody. Maybe there was just a little delay there. So, okay. Christina Hamilton can see them and Catherine Lawson. Thank you very much. Okay. So to begin our pattern, I just automatically made a slip knot, but that's not actually how we start. We start this pattern with a magic circle. And this little chart right here is not included in the written pattern, um, but it is very handy. So I'm holding it very still here on your screen. So if you are familiar with screenshotting, you can take a screenshot, or if you come back and watch this recording later, you'll be able to get this chart as well, because it's just a whole lot easier for some of us to follow the chart. So that said, we are going to start with our magic circle. Now, the magic circle is something that a lot of people make um, in a few different ways. Here is how I make it. I'm going to take that tail end of my yarn right here, and then I am going to go over my first finger of my non-hook hand twice towards me. So there's once, 
and there's twice, just like that. Go ahead and grab that little tail end and hold it down. And then what I'm going to do, and I'm just adjust it down, give myself a little bit more of a tail there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to insert my hook under both of those loops. And then I'd like to just grab that one furthest back and pull it forward just under that loop. Then I can yarn over and pull that loop through. And that sort of locks that little loop together. Now, as we continue to crochet into this magic circle, we want to make sure that we go under this loop that's around my finger and under this little tail, because that's what's going to allow us to tighten up that circle at the end. So to begin round one, we're now ready to begin round one. We're going to start with a chain one, like so. And then we insert our hook under both of those loops. And for those who want to repeat, um, this pattern is made with several of these small motifs, so I will be making the entire motif again. So I'm going to yarn over and pull that loop up and yarn over and pull through two to make a single crochet. Then uh, we work a half double crochet right into that magic circle. You can see I pulled my finger out so I can go right into the ring. And yes, I will be starting again with another motif. But we're gonna get through one at a time here. So I pull up and make our half double crochet. Then I make a double crochet. So we pull through two and pull through two. Then we chain three, one, two, three. Then back into that magic ring, we work a double crochet, followed by a half double crochet, followed by a single crochet, and then another half double crochet. And then another double crochet. And then we chain three again. One, two, three. And then going right back into that magic ring again, we have a double crochet and a half double crochet. So if we come back to our chart right here, you can see. This is our first row. We've worked our magic circle. Chain one, single crochet, half double crochet, double crochet, chain three, double crochet, half double crochet, single crochet, half double crochet, double crochet, chain three, double crochet, half double crochet. All that is worked into that magic ring for our first round. Then we simply join with a slip stitch. But to do that, we want to close up that circle a little bit. You can see right now how it's nice and big, and that's been great for working into it, but now we want it to be nice and small. So we're going to go ahead and pull on this tail, and you can see it starts closing that magic circle right up. Now, if we were making a hat or you know possibly some other item like a basket, we'd want to pull hard enough to close up this little ring completely. But for this pattern, we want to leave a little bit of a circle there. So you can kind of eyeball it and see that looks like a good size for that to stay open. And we're going to leave that open as part of our design. You can see right here in our finished star, that'll be those little circles inside our points right there. So again, for anybody who's confused, don't worry, I will definitely be showing these steps again. We, this, the way this is made, we make several of these motifs and then sew them together. So I'm just going to get through, get through it once and then we'll do it again together. So here we are at the end of round one and I want to go ahead and insert my hook under the top two loops of that first single crochet we made for a slip stitch. Like so. So that is what it should look like at the end of round one. To begin our second round, we're going to chain three and that's going to count as our first half double crochet and a chain one. So when I'm making those two uh, chains for the half double crochet, I tend to keep those a little tighter. Otherwise, they tend to get a little bit taller than I like my half double crochet to be. Then we can chain one more for the chain one. And then we're going to half double crochet right back down in that same first stitch, the one we joined to, the single crochet. 
just like so. Just pull those loops on through one at a time there, however it works for you to get them worked off. So we've got chain three and a half double crochet worked right into that very first stitch. After that, we half double crochet in the next two stitches. So one in each of those. So there's one half double crochet in the first stitch and then a half double crochet in the next stitch. And you can see that brings us to the chain three. In the chain three, we're going to work two double crochet, or excuse me, two half double crochets, chain three, and two more half double crochets all into that chain three space. So you don't have to work into individual chains, just right into that chain three space. We put our hook right in there and make one half double crochet, then a second half double crochet, then chain three, one, two, three, then two more half double crochets right in that same chain three space. So there is one and two. Now you can see that's brought us around to the other side of our round one. So we want to work a half double crochet in the first two of those stitches. So there's one, two, and then in the next one, which is the center of those five stitches right there, the single crochet we made, we're going to work a half double crochet, chain one, half double crochet. So there's the first half double crochet, then we chain one, and then we go right back into that same stitch with another half double crochet, like so. And that mirrors what we've done over here with our chain three and half double crochet. That's essentially what we've mirrored right there. So then we half double crochet in those next two stitches as we approach that chain three again. So now that we're back at that at our next chain three space, we are going to work two half double crochets, chain three, two half double crochets. So there's two half double crochets, chain three, and then two more right back in that chain three space. So just like we did at the other one. Let's see, there we go. And then we've just got two stitches left here. So we work a half double crochet in each of those. So there's one and two. And then we can join that second chain right there, which would be the top of our half double crochet. And the way that's easiest to do this, I'm gonna put this down and I'm going to go ahead and cut my end. And normally I would cut a good six inches or so to weave in, but we're going to be sewing these motifs together. So you'll want to cut about a foot. Just sort of eyeball, it doesn't have to be exactly 12 inches. You just wanna leave a little bit for uh, you know sewing in. And then we pull up on that loop with our hook or your fingers, whatever works, just pull it up on through that stitch there and get that other end out of the way there so it doesn't get confused. All right, so now what we can do is take our yarn needle and a yarn needle is just like a sewing needle but with a bigger eye in it so we can get our yarns through it. And then of course the whole needle itself is quite a bit larger. There we are. And then you can simply insert your needle right you can go into that second chain you go into that chain space whatever works for you and pull that yarn right through that chain and then you can send it right back down through the stitch it came out of get that yarn over there so i don't accidentally tie a knot and that is it for our first motif this is ready to be sewn to the other ones to create this star. So you can see this one right here is finished. We've made one of those motifs now. And now we have to make five more to make a whole nother star. So we set this one aside and start over with a second motif, which is why I was like, just hold on, there will be a second one. Um, so before I start the second one, I wanna pull, I saw a couple people asking to see that chart again. So I'm going to pull that up here for those who want to see the chart. And again, um, if you don't get a chance to screenshot this or you don't know how to do that, this video will be recorded and will be on the Michaels YouTube channel. So you can definitely come back and look at this again if you'd like. All right. So hey, I will Mara, go sorry, ahead. Do you mind if I ask a quick question? Sure. 
We're just having a little bit of trouble accessing the pattern um, okay. linking to the Google Doc because of the swiggles. And I know that a couple of people are looking at the version on Yarnspirations, but did mm -hmm. you say it got updated recently? I believe it was supposed to be updated yesterday um, because there was an error in the pattern, um, which is how we ended up with this beautiful chart, <laughs> trying to mm -hmm. figure it out. Um, but I, I honestly haven't had a chance to go back today and see which okay. um, which one is on there. I must, I apologize for that. No, 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 that's okay. Um, same here. I'm from Young Inspirations. <laughs> for, for everyone here today, the Google Doc that I'm linking to in the chat is the correct pattern. I know it does have the squiggles at the moment, and I'm sorry we can't edit those for you now. But the one on Yarnspirations, we can't be 100% sure in this moment that's that's true and correct. So there may be a couple of errors there. So again, if you can refer to the one that I'm linking to in the Google Doc, you'll find this to be the most accurate. Okay. Thanks, Tamara. Sure, thank you. All right, so I know people want to see the magic circle again. As I was saying, don't worry, we have five more of these we have to make to make a whole star. So. We will definitely be starting over here from the beginning. So we've got our end. Let's go again. We need to make at least one more of these so I can show how to sew them together. So we are going to take our end of our yarn and I'm going to wrap it over my non-hook forefinger twice towards me. Sounds like a lot, but it's simply bring the yarn towards me around my finger. There's once and there's twice. So there's the end and it's towards me. Then I can hold on to that end with my fingers my other fingers there. And then I will insert my hook under both of those loops. So the one I'm holding down and that first one that went around my finger. Then I'm going to use my hook to just grab that loop and pull it just, I always say in front, I guess it's to the right, but just in front of the loop that I'm holding down. Okay, so I've got a good bit of tension there holding that together. Then I turn my hand over so that I can yarn over and grab that yarn and just pull a loop barely between those two loops like so. Then I can go ahead and move that tail end back to where it was and start crocheting my first round. And for that first stitch at least, I always like to keep this loop on my finger to help make sure I get it nice and locked together. So to begin, I'm going to yarn over for a chain one, like so. And then I'm going to work a single crochet into the magic ring. So I want to go under both of those loops. You can see right there, I'm under the one around my finger and that tail end. So I'll yarn over and pull that loop up and then yarn over again. And that's a single crochet, like so, okay? So let's start that again. For those who need to see it again, just because I'm mindful of time, I've got this tail end of my yarn I'm going to wrap it over my finger twice towards me. So you can see there's my hand, got the yarn. I wrap it over my finger once and then up over my finger again. And there's that tail end of the yarn. And you wanna leave a good little bit here so that you can weave in your ends when you're done. And you'll do that using your yarn needle. So with those two loops on my finger, I'm going to take my hook and insert it under both of those loops. You can see my hook just grabs that one in back. Oh, <laughs> I dropped it. Like I say, sometimes using a different style of hook is a little easier when we've got little hooks and bigger yarn. We just pull that right to the front there. Then yarn over and pull that loop through to sort of lock the magic circle together. And then we can start following the instructions. We chain one, insert the hook under both of those loops, yarn over again, pull up a loop, and yarn over and pull through two for a single crochet. After you've made that single crochet, then you can go ahead and pull your finger out because now that magic circle is nice and stable and you can crochet right into that ring. So the next stitch we make is a half double crochet and I saw somebody asking how to make that. So we'll do that one nice and slow together here too. We yarn over, then we go into the ring and make sure you send your hook into that ring and under that little tail right there. Yarn over, pull up our loop, 
Now we've got three loops on our hook. So to finish a half double crochet, we yarn over and pull through all three of those loops. Like so, and that's a half double crochet. And we'll be making a couple of, quite a few more of those. So you'll see that again here in a minute. The next one is a double crochet. So it starts the same way, we yarn over, go into the ring, yarn over again, pull up our loop, yarn over and pull through two, and then yarn over again and pull through two. So that's our double crochet. So, so far in our ring, we've got a single crochet, a half double crochet, and a double crochet. Then we chain three. One, two, three. Then we, oh, we, we actually do, we do we yarn over. <laughs> and then we have to work another double crochet into the ring. So again, I'm just putting my hook right into the middle of that ring, pull up my loop, yarn over and pull through two, yarn over and pull through two for a double crochet. Then it's another half double crochet. So we yarn over, go into the ring, yarn over and pull up our loop, yarn over and pull through all three loops. Then a single crochet, we just go straight in without a yarn over first, pull up a loop, yarn over and pull through two. So we've got just over half of our little motif made here for round one. Then it's back to the half double crochet. So we yarn over, go into the ring, yarn over, pull up our loop, yarn over and pull through all three loops. Then a double crochet, we yarn over, go into the ring, pull up our loop, yarn over and pull through two, and yarn over and pull through two. So now that we've made a double crochet, it's time for another chain three. So one, two, and three. Then it's time for another double crochet. So we yarn over, go into the ring, Yarn over and pull up a loop. Yarn over and pull through two. Yarn over and pull through two. So that's our double crochet. Then we do have a half double crochet. So we yarn over, go into that loop, pull up our yarn, yarn over and pull through all three. Then we single crochet again. We just go right on in, pull up our loop, yarn over and pull through two. And then continuing around, we've got, uh, let's see, actually I have one too far. We, I made one too many stitches. We don't need that single crochet because we worked all the way around. So we finish with that double crochet and half double crochet for round one, because we've already got that first single crochet we made right there that we're going to join to. But before we join to it, we want to pull on that tail end to close up our magic circle. So we can start pulling there. And if you need to, you can kind of pinch that circle with your other fingers as you pull to give it a little bit more stability. That's something I tend to like to do. And we just wanna make sure not to pull it all the way closed. You want to leave a nice little circle there for our design. So you just keep giving that a little tug until you have the right size hole for you. You can kind of pull up your other one and make sure those holes are about the same size so that they look the same in your finished project. Then when you do go back and weave in our ends, when you weave in that end around the magic circle, you wanna make sure that you, as you pull, you don't pull that circle closed, but that you also weave that end in opposite directions with your needle to really help lock it in so that it doesn't open up on its own. So to finish off round one, we insert our hook under the top two loops of that first single crochet we made and yarn over and pull through there and then pull right on through the loop on our hook for a slip stitch. Okay, so then we are ready for round two. And it looks like the updated, uh, Lillian, did you wanna go ahead and make an announcement about that? Sure, thank you. Um, hi everyone, so I've just put in the, PD the updated PDF for the pattern of the star coasters that we're working on today into the chat. And I'm sorry, it does still have the swiggles at the moment. We're seeing if we can resolve that with the Michaels team. Um, there's also the chart, which you might find helpful. Um, 
the same one that Tamara, Tamara is showing today, as well as the stitch key. So you can download oh. those there and I'll pop them in again shortly for anyone that's missed them as well. Fantastic. Yes, I think this is, for those who like to follow charts, the chart is that much easier for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks everyone for your patience. All righty. So let's go ahead and move on to round two. So round two, we start with a chain three. And that chain three is going to count as our first half double crochet and then a chain one. So those first two chains count as a half double crochet and then we've got a third one, which is a chain one. Then we're going to half double crochet right back into that same stitch we joined to, that single crochet. So we yarn over, go right back in that first stitch, yarn over again, pull up our loop and yarn over and pull through all three. Whenever I have a chain in front, I always kind of have to give it a little bit of leverage to pull through that last loop. So that's totally normal with those half double crochets. So even though th those are chains, it's going to count half double crochet, chain one, half double crochet. Then we half double crochet in the next two stitches. Oops, I'm gonna make sure to go under both of those top two loops. So there's one and two, just like all our other half double crochets, like so. And that brings us to that chain three space, our first chain three space for round two. We're going to work two half double crochets, chain three, two half double crochets, all into the chain three space. So again, not individ individual chains, just right into that space right underneath. So we yarn over, go right into the chain three space, pull up our loop and yarn over and pull through all three. So there's one, we do that again, there's two, chain three, one, two, three. Then we put two more half double crochets into that chain three space. So there's one, and there's two, like so. Now we've got five stitches all lined up here, double crochet, half double crochet, single crochet, half double crochet, double crochet. So in the first one, we work a half double crochet. In the second one, we work a half double crochet. And in the third one, we're going to work a half double crochet, chain one, and another half double crochet, all into that same stitch, like so. There we are. We've got two more stitches left. So we yarn over and put a half double crochet in each of those. So there's one and two. And that brings us to our second chain three space. So we do the same thing. Two half double crochets, chain three, two half double crochets, all into that chain three space. So there's one, two, and then chain three. One, two, three. And then back in for two more half double crochets. So there's one and two. And then there are just two stitches left. So we put a half double crochet in each of those. So there's one and two. And with that, we have finished our second motif. So we need to put that down and bring up our end here so we can cut a nice long end for this one again. And then pull up on that end and we can get it on our yarn needle. My hooks and things. Looks like I grabbed a different yarn needle this time. I always have a few sitting next to me. This one's got a little bend in it. Some say that makes it easier to weave in their ends. Some people don't like it, totally up to you. So we're gonna come back and if it's easiest, it doesn't really matter. You can go into that second chain if you want to or you can go right into that whole space right there, whatever's easiest for you. Pull that end on through. And then I like to send that end right back down. Let me see if I can get it really close here. Right back down into the center of the stitch it came out of. You can see that's where that string came out, it comes back around. If we send it right back down in there, it gives it a really nice look, as long as we don't accidentally tie a knot in our yarn. And give it a little tug there. And now this one is all ready for sewing to the next one. 
So before we start sewing, because I want to make sure to go over that and the blocking and stiffening as well, I saw a couple people would like another look at the magic circle. Um, was there another part, Lillian, that I needed to go over again? A lot of the questions are in and around the magic circle or alternatives for that, if you have some. Okay. Um, well, you could, there's a couple different ways you could do it. Um, because we want to leave a little bit more opening here, the magic circle is probably the easiest way to do that. But you can also make a slip knot like so. And normally when you make a slip knot, you know, you'd pull it right down to your hook, right? To make sort of a chain size knot. Instead, <laughs> the great thing about a slip knot is that it is adjustable. So you can go ahead and leave that a little bit more open right there. So you have a nice big loop on your hook rather than your usual slip knot. And then if you give that a little leverage, you can sort of pull through and chain one and start working right into that for your first stitch. Like so, you can see I'm kind of just working into the back loop there. So there's my single crochet followed by a half double crochet. And I'll make another double crochet so you can kind of get an idea how it looks here. I know my fingers are right on top of it, but it's just one little, one little loop, so it's hard to show. So you can kind of just keep working right around that starting chain if you want to, or the slip knot itself, if you prefer. Um, but for those of us who wanted to see it again, before we do go on to the, the joining of our motifs, one more time, let's do this magic circle. It is really such a great um, technique and it's so handy to know. So we've got our tail end of our yarn and I have my non-hook hand. I'm gonna take my first finger here and I'm going to go over it once with the yarn. And at this point, I like to kind of put my other fingers on top of it to stabilize it a little bit. And then again, you can see how that yarn came up over my finger towards me. So now I've got my tail end right there and I can, can secure it with the other fingers of that hand to hold those two loops on my finger. Then I insert my hook under both of those loops on my finger and pull that first loop we made around our finger just under the edge of the second one, the one that's actually the tail end that I'm holding on to. Then a little convoluted. I kind of have to turn my hand over here in order to grab that working yarn. But if I pull that through there again, you can see now our little magic circle is pretty well locked together. So from there, I can grab my end again so I can do a chain one. And then I can stitch right into that ring. Like I say, the big thing is you always want to make sure that you go under that loop around your finger and that tail end so that when you are done, you can pull on that tail end to close up your circle to the size you desire. You can close it up nice and tight. You can leave a little bit of a hole like we're doing here today. So that is basically the magic circle. Um, again, this will be recorded. So if you wanna see that even slower, um, a great recommendation is look for the little icon should be kind of right down here <laughs> on your screen. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a little gear and you can actually change the speed of videos um, to make them faster or slower. So whatever works for you, feel free to change the speed of the video so that you can see um, that a little bit closer. So, and again, and all this will of course be included in the video as well. So now that we have a couple of our motifs made here, like I say, the first thing you'll probably wanna do is go ahead and weave in these magic circle ends. So I'm just going to show you really quickly how I do that and make sure that they don't come back out. Now, this is the direction you can see that my tail was kind of going inside there. That's the direction I've been crocheting over it. So I'll send my needle just around that loop a little bit more just to kind of complete the circle, get it just, I can adjust it a little bit still at this point, make it a little tighter. If I really wanted to, I could probably pull it open a little looser, but I like the size of this circle. So what I want to do now is I want to use my needle to go back the opposite direction. And I think this is the step that sometimes people miss with magic circles and then they'll come open on them after their project's finished and they think they can, you know, they're all done weaving in their ends. And then all of a sudden that circle starts coming open. It's really important to send your ends back the opposite direction with that yarn needle. 
And that really helps lock down that magic circle so it won't be open back up on you. See now, now it is a very stable circle. So just to be sure, I can send that back the opposite direction again, just to help lock it down even further. And then I can go ahead and trim off that little end. Oop. There we go, like so. So now this one is ready to be thrown to the next one. And like I said, the way this is made, you make a total of six of these motifs and then sew them all together. And where we sew them from is that little chain one at the side on down to the center of the chain three. And then this end will be left open to create that shape. So what I recommend is when you finished it off and you've got your tail end, it's going to be close to, depending on how you sewed it in, that chain one space that we sewed two together there at the end of round two. So we can go ahead and take our yarn needle and put this end on here now. And I'm just going to go ahead and I want to bring that end back over here to that chain one, or at least close to it, right up next to it like so. And I'm doing this from the back of my little motif here. There we are. There we go. And then I want to take the next one that I'm going to sew to. And now this one, I want to point this out. This one has that long end for sewing too. So I don't want to sew to this side because then my long ends are going to be next to each other. I want to sew to this side so that this end is now ready to sew to the next one and the next one and so on. So if you take that little extra time to make sure you're sewing to that side, you won't end up having to cut an extra bit of yarn to, uh, you know, to have to sew them together with. So let me get through the sewing part and um, we'll see if we can go back and show some more of the motif again. So to sew them together, I can say, as I said, I'm coming out sort of of that chain one space on the first one. So I want to come over here and look for that chain one space on this one. And it's okay to turn it around and it doesn't matter which one um, except for those ends. We just wanna make sure that we find that chain one space right in between those stitches. And then from the back, I'm going to go ahead and put my needle under the top two loops of that chain, like so. And I can start pulling that yarn on through, get all those other little ends out of the way, which is why I said it's easier if you sew in those center ones first, I didn't do it on the second one, but there we go. So if I get them straightened out and give it a little pull, you can see that pulls them up close and next to each other. So then they recommend we use the whip stitch, which simply means we come from the bottom on one and go in from the top on the other. So even though we sort of came from that chain one space, I wanna go ahead and send my needle back through the top of that one, just to make sure it's nice and secure. And whenever you're working with these long ends and sewing, it's a little fiddly, you just wanna take your time Make sure not to tie knots or anything. And then that as you go, you're matching up these stitches. So after my chain one space, I've got a half double crochet. So I wanna make sure to get under that. And then if you need to, you can turn the whole thing around. Make sure you find that next half double crochet right there. Like so. And then you just come back to the other side again. Find that next stitch. And as you sew, it gets a little easier to find those two. And then the next one over here on this side. And you just keep on sewing all the way down until you get to the center right there. And you've sewn all the way through those sets of stitches and through those chains. Then you can weave in that end and come over here and add your next one over and over and over again until you have six of them sewn together. Then it's time to block and stiffen, which I can go over here in a moment. Um, but one thing I keep seeing pop up is people would like to see the invisible join again. That's a little harder. Let me try and pull one out here because of course I don't have time at this point to make a whole new motif. But luckily, since I didn't weave this end in, I can sort of fake it a little bit here. So I'm going to undo what I've done. If you give me just a moment here. So that we can see how that worked. So okay. let's see here, kind of faking it here. Okay, so ta-da, starting over. We've gone back in time. Now I have finished this motif. We're ignoring that I've already sewn it to one. We're saying I'm just still so uh, crocheting this one. I've made that last stitch, that last um, would have been a half double crochet. 
and I've cut my yarn. So now I just lift up with my hook to pull that loop on up and through. So now it's coming straight out of that very last stitch I made right there. You can see it's coming out right in the middle of those two loops, the top V, which is exactly where it should be. So then I can put it on my yarn needle. And then I can come over here and depending, you know, how it depends on the pattern. You're going to use this sort of technique in different ways on different patterns. For this particular pattern, you could choose to go under the top two loops of that second chain, since that's officially the top of our half double crochet. Or because of the way they're, we're sewing these together, you could just go into that chain space, whatever works for you. So we put our needle right under those top two loops of our first stitch, whatever that stitch may be. Pull it on through from front to back here. Get that little tail through as well. And then I'm going to come right back over here, right there. You can see that's where the yarn came out, where I pulled it out from the center of that stitch. That's where I want to put my yarn needle. I want to go right down in between the front and back loop with that needle again. And this is where I keep trying to sew a knot in back. I have to make sure not to actually make a knot with my yarn. But if we pull this all the way through, including that little tail, just a little too long, there we go. You can see that starts looking like a crochet stitch right there on top. So if I give that a little tug, it becomes indistinguishable from another stitch there along our top row. And that's why that's usually called the invisible join um, or a seamless finish. There's different names for it, but it really just kind of disappears right in that line. And uh, of course, now you've got your tail all ready for weaving in your end or sewing your motifs together. So now with this one, I would go ahead and sew to the next one over. So like I say, whip stitch is just back and forth with your needle going through and through and through until you get to the center and then add your next motif on around and around and around. So at the end, you'll have a little bit of open space there. And see here, when you sew these together, that'll be the open space created here. And if I lay it down, maybe you can see the white through it a little easier. Well, maybe not. <laughs> We're at the wrong angle, but you can kind of see, there we go. You can see we leave that center space open for our magic circle. And those are our chain three spaces right there. And so once we've sewn it together and we'll woven in, weaved in, <laughs> whatever the past tense of weave is, then you are ready to finish it up. So the way they recommend finishing this up is by blocking it and then stiffening it. So I went ahead and brought over some of my blocking supplies because I usually get a lot of questions about blocking and because this was such a, you know, two round, uh, two round uh, pattern. Um, I thought, you know, let's go ahead and cover this a little bit. Um, I did see a question pop up. That was the whip stitch. We're just going up and over, up and over and up and over around um, for the whip stitch. That said, if you have a different method that you'd prefer to sew those motifs together and you think it looks good, you're good. Don't worry about it. Um, let me pull my camera up. Sorry for anybody who gets a little seasick here. Let me just pull my camera up a little bit more so we can get a little bit better view of what I'm doing here. So this is my blocking board and there are many different types of blocking boards on the market. Um, you know, absolutely go to your local Michaels. I think they've got probably some better ones there with grids uh, than in retrospect, I wish I'd invested in, but this is the one I have. So having something like this is really handy. If you don't have a blocking board, you can use a nice folded towel, um, you know, dish towel, bath towel, just something that you can pin in and that can handle being wet. So what you want to do to block out your project is you can either get it wet beforehand or you can pin it out and then spray it with water. If you have a spray bottle that you can just put some water in, that's what I use, um, like say, or you can just run it under the sink. It's Red Heart Super Saver. Go ahead and run it right under the sink before you pin it out. But to pin it out, you basically, um, it's a lot like laying flat to dry. If you've ever bought a really nice sweater that said hand wash, lay flat to dry, um, you may not have hand washed it, you, but you probably laid it out nice and flat and kind of reshaped it to dry. Blocking really is the same thing. So all you need to do is sort of straighten out your project, however you want it to lay, and then start using pins. And these are clover forked blocking pins uh, or U-pins that you can purchase at Michael's. And I really like these, they are stainless steel, which is important because this would be wet. We don't want anything that can rust. So that's important to think about. Um, and I like these because while this project is a little unique with its points, um, these are really great for getting a really nice straight edge because you can kind of use those two points to pull out your nice edges. But for this project, you can kind of just use them 
like this, where I'm kind of using them sideways, or if you have T-pins, that could be another good choice this is a T-pin right here. And you really just kind of want to give each of those points a little bit of a tug. We just want to make sure that they're all pulled out really nice and look just the way we like them. Then all you need to do is spray it with a little bit of water, or if you've got a steamer, you could steam it a little bit, let it dry, and that'll be all done. That's all there is to blocking, easy as can be. When the blocking is done, then you go ahead and unpin it, and that's when you can choose to stiffen it. And there are different methods of stiffening. Some people actually like to use, um, I think it's one part of Elmer's school glue to three parts water. Um, for me, one of my favorite tips is to um, use spray starch, which I have right here. This is, I have had this can, I actually was checking this right before we went live. Um, I have had this can since at least 2014 and it's still mostly full. <laughs> and I've used it to block many things. So this stuff will last forever. I don't even know if this is what the bottle looks like anymore at the store, but over in the laundry section, you can get this stuff. And you can see I've put down some paper towels. I just want to protect my surface. And then from the back, and I do recommend that you do this from the back. So you'll want to turn that over. And the way I can tell the front from the back on this project is I just look at those top two loops and make sure those are in the same direction that I would crochet in. So I know this is the front, so this is the back. So then, you just go ahead and spray it. I'm not gonna spray on camera because it'll probably hit a camera and we'll all go blind, but you just give it a light spray right over the top, let it dry. If it's stiff enough, you're done. If you want it a little stiffer, you can give it another spray. This is also a great tip if you are using these, for instance, as a motif or as an applique. Like we were talking earlier, it looks so much like a beautiful poinsettia. You could very easily sew this onto for example, a beautiful white blanket that you've crocheted for someone for the holidays, and it would really dress it up beautifully. So if you're going to sew it on as an applique or any other thing that you're using an applique, that fabric stiffener can be a really great um, tool for that as well, because it'll help hold the shape of your applique as you sew it on, so you don't end up accidentally crunching in one of those edges as you sew. So that is my little tip on, tip on stiffening there. So did we have any questions I could answer, Lillian? comma, Lillian. Sorry, that was weird. <laughs> I'm comma, sorry, long, <laughs> long pause. Um, I just wanted to quickly share with everyone before we ask questions that I have just popped a link uh, to a new Google Drive folder into the chat. And if you click on that link, you can go ahead and download the updated pattern PDF, as well as the diagram and the stitch key as well. So for anyone that's been having trouble because they're on iPads, this should solve that one for you. Awesome. Okay. Um, now questions, mm -hmm. um, there's one here from uh, Chato asking what type of surface um, is that one? Oh, I'm sorry, that doesn't make any sense. Um, my best guess, well, I, uh, this is a table. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> made out of melanine, I think. Don't yeah. think it's uh, that. Melamine. Um, this is paper towel, which I just mm -hmm. put down underneath there. And this is just, um, this is my, my particular uh, blocking board that I happen to have. I think it's just basically foam. It's some sort of foam mm -hmm. with a flocked surface. I really don't know. Like I say, I bought these, this is probably older than my spray starch. We'll put it that way. Um, so <laughs> in retrospect, in 2020, if I were to go out and purchase new ones, I would absolutely go get some of the ones with grids. Um, they have blocking boards now that have sort of the grid printed on for inches, which is always really handy. So I recommend if you're going out to get some, you look for those because those, those are just mighty nice. They, I, they look incredibly handy, is all yes. I have to say to that. <laughs> yep. Um, we were also wondering, um, have you used anything other than spray starch or glue to stiffen? Um, for me, no, I've, I think there's probably some dippable starches, but for me, spray starch and the school glue. School glue is what I started out with before I bought the spray starch. Um, I've used it on um, primarily things like snowflakes, which, you know, normally you would make out of thread. Um, but yeah, once I discovered the spray starch, I've kind of been a big fan of it. It even smells like lavender. Oh, Ooh. yum. <laughs> so soothing. I know. <laughs> right? If you're going to craft. Um, yeah, oh, absolutely. Somebody mentioned, uh, I see somebody mentioned Mod Podge. Mod Podge would be great too. I hadn't, I didn't think of it, but yes, Mod, Mod Podge, you could have a lot of fun great. with uh, yarn it. and Mod Podge doing all kinds of great creative projects. Mm -hmm. um, I did see a question pop up about steaming acrylic and you can absolutely mm -hmm. steam acrylic. Um, you want to take it slow. Don't go, you know, don't get too fast, too hard, too fast. Um, 
because it can melt if you overdo it. But if you're careful and take your time, you know, keep a couple inches between you and the steamer. Steaming acrylic is wonderful. It's brilliant. You can absolutely set your shape really well um, with ac ac acrylic and steaming. Um, I know some people like to say you can't block acrylic. I couldn't disagree more. I block acrylic every day, <laughs> almost every day. And so, what would you um, say is like, what are the advantages of blocking a pinning or steaming? I'm sorry, can you say that last bit again? Would you be able to recap on what the advantages of blocking, pinning or steaming would be? Uh, well, blocking it out is just, you know, pinning it out, um, which I would recommend you do that whether you're using water or steam. Go ahead and pin it out. You don't want to be trying to hold it down with your hands and steaming at the same time. Recipe for disaster. Pin it out so you can get your hands out of there and just get the steamer in there. Um, the steam is actually going to make it a little softer. So if for this project, you might not want to steam it, but if it was, say, a wearable or something that you wanted a lot of drape in, like a scarf, then steaming would be a really good option. Um, for this, I simply did water because I wanted it to be stiff in the end. I didn't want it to get any softer and steaming can soften it up. But if my motifs came out really wonky, if they just, you know, if they weren't the right shape or whatever, and I really needed to reshape them, or if it's a project, you know, a different project where you really want to pull on something and shape it a whole bunch, then steaming can go a long way to helping that set. And it'll do, it'll be a little bit more permanent, if you will, than the water will. The water, just water by itself, isn't necessarily a permanent solution, although it can help the stitches sort of relax and get into where they want to be. Um, if your tension was off at all, it can help even that out. Um, but if it's what you might call a dramatic blocking, like you're stretching something open for a stitch pattern, or you really want to shape something specifically, then steaming can be uh, a more permanent blocking method for sure. And like I say, if it's just a matter of getting it stiff so you can sew it onto something or stiff because you want it to be a coaster, then that's where you would want to go ahead and use the fabric stiffener. Um, but this will wash out, of course. So if you, it's something you're going to wash, you would need to reapply your stiffener uh, every time you wash it. So I hope that answered that question a little. It did. Very interesting. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and Patty asks uh, just earlier, is that whip stitch or blanket stitch that you were doing? I was using, I was using the whip stitch. Um, but if you, you know, I may have accidentally sent it under the wrong spot to get the blanket stitch. I didn't mean to, but uh, I was attempting to just whip stitch it. If you have a different method, some people like to use the mattress stitch. I use that a lot for garments. Um, then absolutely you can use the mattress stitch to sew it together. It's whatever works for you, honestly, it's going to look pretty darn good. As long as you're consistent, I would just make sure you use the same technique all the way around so that they do all match. And I think you'll like the results. Very nice. Um, there's also a hot tip here that um, I might share from Jamie, um, suggesting just to put a dab towel over to steam, which is actually a good idea and, uh, you know, yes. a safe way to protect the acrylic if your iron is yes. a little bit hot, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Especially if you are using an actual iron um, to do your steaming rather than a steamer, a dedicated steamer. Um, yes, a damp towel over your project. Big, big help. That'll keep you from most of the way, unless you get the iron directly on top. If you press it with the iron, you're going to kill the acrylic. You're really going to melt it and create one fused mass. But yes, that will help. Uh, that will help quite a bit as well if you're worried about accidentally melting your project. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we've all done that at least once in our lives. I know oh, I yeah. have. Yep. <laughs> and yep. it can be done on purpose too. You know, honestly, I made at one point, and we're getting a little off topic here, but I made uh, masks out of Red Heart Super Saver, uh, you know, just like masquerade masks. And those, of course, you want those to be, to hold their shape, but you also want to be soft and form fitting for the face. Uh, so using the wet towel method, I did go ahead and press down with the iron and it fused the yarn, um, but it made it pliable for the face. So you know, it's, it's a really fun thing. If you haven't played around with steaming or killing acrylic before, you can take some of your old swatches, some of your old gauge swatches, and just really play with the different effects you can get and see what happens when you use the different techniques. Um, always protect your iron. Always, always, if you're going to touch the iron to it, always protect it with wet cloth or you will ruin your iron. But otherwise, you can play with those different techniques and see, see what it does to your yarn and uh, see what technique you like. Awesome. Any other questions here? We've just got a couple minutes left. We have lots of very happy people that are saying they learned a lot oh, good, and are very grateful. Good. Thank you. Uh, one question here. Oh, how do you get the link to the updated pattern? Let me pop that in again for everyone. Okay. One moment. Great. Yes, check the, uh, check the chat for the pattern 
or you can go to it sounds like um red heart star crochet coasters is what here's the here's what the actual written pattern should look like at least on the first page <laughs> so you can see here they made them in really pretty blues this is misty delft blue and light blue some really pretty shades so you can get really different looks depending on the color you choose I love that it's something that you can just use, you know, for any season of the year as well. You know, you can mm -hmm. make that very festive. You could make that for a birthday. There's a lot of options. Um, Absolutely. You can even sorry. hang it from a garland. I was going to say, how cute would these be out as a garland? Too? They would be beautiful. Yeah, just yes. gorgeous. Um, we do have a couple of questions here mm -hmm. um, before we finish up. Marsha asks, is it okay to touch the damp towel over the yarn with the iron and steam? Only if you wanted to melt your yarn. Okay, so... <laughs> so if you're melting if you want to melt your yarn yes if you're trying to make it one like no stitch definition one solid piece of essentially plastic mm -hmm. um sure but otherwise no <laughs> okay and, and Dennis asks here about the front and back uh mm -hmm. they say each motif has has a front and back and are attached with all front are they attached with all fronts facing the same way yes that's how I did it um and that's how the instructions say to do it that said, because these are different motifs, you don't have to, you don't have to, you could flip over every other one, you could do every other one in a different color, you know, do, do every other one in green and red and sew those together, um, flip over one of them if you like the way the back looks, you know, that would just create more interest in your finished project. Um, I would say just be consistent. If you're going to flip over one, flip over every other one. <laughs> um, but otherwise, yes, they are, this is shown all of all the right side up, so to speak, front facing forward. But I always say, you know, when it's a crochet project, you're making it yourself and the point is to make it your own. So if you wanted to play with that, you absolutely could. And like I say, I think there's a lot of possibilities here. I mean, if you, you could do these for the 4th of July, you know, red, white, and blue all the way around. Um, so many, so many different fun things. You could even mix your yarn types if you wanted to. Use, uh, I was thinking about Red Heart Scrubby Smoothie and then uh, maybe the scrubby for every other one if you were doing a dishcloth would be a lot of fun too mm -hmm, absolutely a little bit of extra texture mm. yeah and you can do all kinds of things it's a it's a very versatile pattern with these little motifs <clears throat> okay so I think hopefully that's all the questions it looks like it I think we're all okay. signing off yeah awesome all right so if we can just come back to me maybe here before we make everybody seasick moving the camera. I just wanted to get a chance to thank, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this pattern and I hope you'll give it a try. It's um, really versatile and a lot of fun. And there are so many possibilities um, for holiday gifts or just around your own home or you know, decorating for the holidays. So um, just thank you so much to Michaels for having me and thank you to your inspirations. And Lillian, I'll let you wrap it up. Thanks Tamara. Thanks everyone for joining us today for this live community classroom with Michaels. We would love to see your whips. So share your work with hashtag make it with Michaels and hashtag Yarnspirations. And a reminder that you can find more classes on michaels.com and the recording from today's class on michaels.com slash classes. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye everybody. Have a great day.